Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Hot Topic webinar today, Making the Connection, Linking Early Brain Development Research to Practice. Before we get started today, I want to turn it over to Violetta. She's going to share with you all about how our platform works. Violetta? Hi, thank you so much, April. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as you can see, as some people are entering um, their hellos, this is the chat panel. Please use that to enter any comments, any questions you may have, also any um, tech issues you may be experiencing, and we'll be able to help you troubleshoot through that. Um, this PowerPoint, a copy of this PowerPoint is also available um, in the handouts panel. So it's the last uh, the last icon from the left side. If you just click on that, a new panel is going to open. If you click view, it'll be downloaded and you could um, find it in your downloads folder. Um, and um, if you happen to close any of the panels, you could just click on that first icon. It's an arrow that's a circle and that should restore your settings to um, their default settings. And um, once again, welcome and enjoy. April, back to you. Thank you so much, Violetta. We're so happy to have you as a support on our webinar. Well, my name is April Westerman, and I'm an infant toddler specialist with Region 10 with the Infant Toddler Network in the State Capacity Building Center, a uh, service of the Office of Child Care. We also have two amazing guest speakers that we'll introduce a little bit later today, and I also wanted my peer, Holly, to introduce herself. Holly? Hi, everyone. So glad you're here and great to be here with you today. Thanks, Holly. All right. So before we get started, we really wanted to know who is with us today. So in a minute, we're going to pull up a poll for you to um, share with us your role. And um, then we'll show the results and see um, all kinds of professionals that are here with us today. So we're going to bring over the poll. And Holly is going to um, go through the results with you. And we'll give you a few minutes or a minute or two to, to pick the role that best fits you. So go ahead. Let's see what we got here. Holly? All right, everybody. So you should see some choices here. We want to know before we get started, who's with us? And what role do you serve? How do you touch the lives of babies and toddlers? So maybe you uh, most affiliate with being a community member. Maybe you are in a classroom with baby in arms or toddler in arms or on the carpet square. Uh, maybe you're a family member. Maybe you manage a state level project. Uh, maybe you are a technical assistance provider. You offer coaching or mentoring or consultation. So uh, before we move along, let's um, have everyone take a second. And if you don't see your choice listed in the poll selections, feel free to write into the chat uh, the option that best fits your role. So we're going to give everybody just a few more seconds. Uh, let us know who's, who's joined us for this conversation today about bringing research to practice. So we're seeing lots of great results here. Uh, so far, it looks like we've got a lot of direct child serving practitioners. So you're in child care, you're in preschool, you're in home visiting, you're teachers. We've got um, a, also a great deal of state government official uh, uh, professionals. We've also got training and technical assistance. So many of you are providing um, coaching and technical assistance in that relationship-based professional development. We're so glad you're here. And then I'm seeing a lot in the chat uh, on infant toddler specialists. We love seeing all of our infant toddler specialists here. Uh, so just a great uh, family child care specialist, quality rating and improvement. Looks like we've got just a great mix of folks. So we're so glad that you've joined our conversation today. And uh, thank you for participating in uh, this initial poll to let us know who's here today. So I'm gonna turn it back over to April and she's gonna get us started going with the rest of our time together. Thanks April. Thanks, Holly. It's so fun to see all of the different professions that are represented, and, I, and we're really glad that you could be with us today. All right. So when in looking at our webinar today, we just wanted to share some objectives with you all. Um, and the first one is that we're going to identify the rationale for making the connection from research to practice. 
We're also going to examine and discuss the importance of infant toddler brain development, and we will share and explore approaches to applying research to improve the quality of infant toddler care. So in order to get started, we just really wanted to um, lay the foundation about brain development, the importance and how it happens. And so um, we just know that there's a need to understand the biology of adversity and that the science of early learning is foundational for reducing disparities in educational achievement for all children. And look at that little baby there just just soaking up all that relationship-based care that, that they're getting right there. I love that picture. All right, so here we have a picture of um, the brain and um, we just wanted to share a, you know, a few of the pieces with you so that we could, as we move on and we talk about strategies and how to use this research to practice, so that um, we understand where infants and toddlers are really growing and learning in um, their physical, mental well-being. And so with the brain, um, the, it grows from the bottom up. And so it starts, the first part to develop is actually the brain stem right there at the very bottom. And it's first to develop because it is responsible for survival skills. So like breathing, heart rate, digestion, things like that. And then the next part that develops down there is the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is responsible for those reflexive behaviors. So infants come, they're born knowing how to suck and blink and the muscle coordination. Next comes the limbic system. And that is the emotion part of the brain. And as we know, working with infants and toddlers or having them ourselves, that infants and toddlers live in their emotion, emotion part of their brain. And so in the limbic system, this is where infants and toddlers are actively forming relationships and connections with those around them in their interactions and their environments. And so here is where they process emotions. Um, the hippocampus is also located in the limbic system and that is responsible for developing long-term memories, motivation, um, and the amygdala is also located there, which is responsible for fear and emotion responses. So just keeping, you know, as we move on throughout the webinar, keep that limbic system and all of its functions in mind, because that is where our infants and toddlers are from zero to three. And finally, the, the next, piece of the brain to develop is that prefrontal cortex, um, which is also often referred to as the executive center because it has advanced, it, that's where our advanced cognitive functions are, um, where we look, where we're um, able to develop problem solving skills, impulse control, and um, emotion regulation. And if we go back to the limbic system, we, that is really where we're, where infants and toddlers are really developing the know-how to process emotions and how to make connections with peers and adults in their lives. And so it's really, really important that um, relationship-based care is first and foremost for infants and toddlers because that, their, that part of their brain is what's developing. And in order for them to have that executive function later in life, they need to have that secure attachment and relationship-based care from the beginning. So let's look at a short two minute video um, to show how the brain works. This video is from the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University, and it's gonna help us understand how experiences build the brain. Child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. 
these connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. I just really appreciate that video because it shows what we were just talking about with, with the brain and the emotion part of the brain and how all of the pieces are connected together. And if connections are made and continually used, they'll grow stronger and stronger. And that's exactly what we want for infant and toddler um, brain development and physical development. So in the chat box, we'd like you to, um, if, if you would like to participate, we have a question here on the slide. We are wondering, what is one gift you would give to infants and toddlers to support their brain development? I know for me and working with infants and toddlers and having my own children, it is just really like the gift of being there for them and holding them as much as I possibly can until they wouldn't let me anymore, <laughs> which is currently happening, happening with my 12 year old. So um, I would just love on those babies as much as I could. Yes, and I'm seeing loving relationships, touch, attachment to caregivers, more love, more love, unconditional love. Yes, secure relationships, being present. You guys all, you, you guys got this, you know, how important relationships and love and nurturing and interactions are so important to those babies um, and just meeting their needs. Um, yes, Rana, thank you. Respect for them as individuals, absolutely. Play, um, nurture, yes. And play looks different for infants and toddlers and, and it still can happen, right? And we are, we're gonna talk about some of these strategies later on, so you guys, are ahead of the game here. Way to go. Physical touch and talking. You guys, you guys are on it. Way to go. We got some really smart folks on here. I'm really glad you guys are here. Oh yes, bonding hugs and smiles with exclamation points. Absolutely. All right, you guys can keep typing in there if you would like and um, I'm gonna move on to the next one. And thank you all for sharing your gifts. I know that all those gifts would be exactly what the infant and toddler brain need to ensure strong relationship building. All right, so I am very pleased and happy to welcome our first guest speaker today. We have Dr. Sarah Lytell. She was the Director of Outreach and Education for the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, also known as iLabs, with the University of Washington. And I'm going to turn it over to, to Sarah, to Dr. Lytels. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, April. And I'm very excited to be here with all of you today. I thank you for, for joining us um, in the middle of what I imagine is a very stressful circumstance for everyone here. I think we're all dealing with our, our own um, areas of, of stress during these times. So I hope that this is an hour and a half where we can kind of come together and think about those infants and toddlers that we are working for. Um, and so I'm excited to share with you today a little bit uh, more about what we're thinking about in terms of the specific practices that help uh, infants and toddlers uh, develop those that great architecture of the brain. And I really just wanted to start with this idea that, you know, we think of the infant's brain, as you saw in this video, as growing through every 
every experience that they have. So you you might, you know, this every time you're outside and see leaves, maybe maybe not the right time of year for that, perhaps flowers this time of year. Every time you're interacting with a caregiver, those connections are forming. And you again, every time you're outside playing, you see those connections strengthen and form. And over time, just like you saw in that video, it is in fact true that those earliest experiences build the foundational architecture of our brains. We know that the baby brain is growing faster in those first three years of life than it's ever gonna grow at another period in life um, at a rate of about a million new connections per second. So the more we can support infants and toddlers by giving them those high quality experiences, the more we're doing to help them build those ar that architecture that's gonna really allow them to be a lifelong learner. And so what I wanted to do today, um, to start out at least, is to think about what are those practices on a very, you know, sort of minute level that really support children's developing brain. And you can almost actually think of these as the gifts that you all just talked about in the chat that April introduced for us. So if we wanted to boil down all of the research into six gifts that we can give infants and toddlers, what does that look like? Now, I will say that these are six uh, gifts that we have selected at the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences um, at the University of Washington. They are by far not exclusive. There's a lot of research to support, you know, many components of these interactions that we have with children on a daily basis. But I would suggest that these are six really important components. Um, and so the more you can think about weaving these into those everyday interactions you have with children, the better we're gonna be at supporting those infants and toddlers. Okay, let's get started. So if we take all of this information about how children learn, what do we know about how we can support children? I think first we would say, have a conversation with them. We know from a lot of research that children learn through those interactions with others. Notice we say have a conversation, not talk at kids. <laughs> it's really important to talk with children, allow them that room to respond, make it this back and forth give and take. I say something and I wait for you to respond. And then I add on it and, and move on and move that conversation to a new space. We know that this is very much related to the children's later language development and in fact to development in a variety of skills later on. And what's really important here, as I mentioned a minute ago, is really that quality of language. We're not thinking of children as this empty bucket that we need to fill with a lot of words. We're really thinking about high quality language and that comes in a variety of ways. It can be the diversity of language you, you use. So maybe instead of talking about the table, you're going to talk about the red round table. Um, so it comes in diversity of words. Particularly with infants and toddlers, we're also thinking about quality in terms of parentese or that infant directed speech, the sort of sing song tone of voice that invites infants to speak back to you, to babble back at you, that we know is related to later language development. So we're thinking here much more about the quality of language that we're, in, that we're using during our interactions with children than the pure quantity. Okay, second gift we can give children. Um, we can share our thinking. So as adults, we have a lot of complex thought processes that happen all the time. And we can share those with children, especially as we're thinking about things that are not obvious. It's much easier to have a conversation with children about the things that populate their world. But when we're talking about things that you can't see, things that you're thinking or feeling, those emotions in particular, it's really helpful for children if you talk about it. I'm feeling really sad right now you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna just take a minute to myself, I'm gonna breathe deeply, and I'm gonna feel better when I come back. You know, talking through that process with children, identifying those feelings, particularly for things you can't see, we know that's really gonna help children's emotional development and social development uh, in the long term. Oftentimes we also think about this as a sort of sports casting. So just like a sports caster would call a baseball game or a soccer game as they're watching it, you can start to sort of narrate what children are doing. Oh, I see that you found that red, uh, the red block over there. What are you gonna do with it? I'll bet, I'll bet you can't uh, find it if I hide it over here, something like that. So start to narrate that thinking and narrate what you're doing. And that's gonna give children an important window into those thought processes that you've spent a lifetime developing. 
So this next piece of things, we're gonna think about following children's lead. And again, I know that these are all things that you know, but I think it's sometimes useful to really codify this. So the more that we can follow children's lead as opposed to directing their interest to something that interests us, we know that that's gonna improve their brain development and their learning. So children are very, very naturally curious and interested in a lot of things in their environment. And we can capitalize on that as adults to really think about you know, expanding that, that interest that they already have demonstrated. So if a child is interested in trucks, let's talk about trucks. Let's look for trucks as they're driving down the street. Let's start to differentiate trucks and talk about how they might be different from each other. And, you know, when we see uh, the dog that's walking by that we might think is incredibly cute, you know, we're really gonna stay focused on the truck if that's what the child is interested in. And you can really have those rich interactions around whatever topic it is, but we know that children are going to learn more, learn faster if we follow their lead and take their indications about what they're already interested in. The next one I would suggest is be a regulator. And I think this is particularly important for infants and toddlers. We know that infants and toddlers have not really developed, uh, you know, a ton of executive functioning skills at this point. In fact, you know, probably um, not many at all. They need help regulating their emotions in particular. They just don't have the skills that yet they're not cognitively there. But what we can do is help them. Early on, we can regulate for them. It's a great, it's exactly the reason why we, you know, our urge is to go comfort and hug a crying baby. That's us providing regulation for them, showing them that we're there. Over time, particularly as children get to be a little bit more sophisticated into toddlerhood, you can help them regulate, but you can also teach them some regulation strategies and teach them how to um, regulate some things for themselves. So maybe it's, I know you're feeling frustrated. What do you think we can do? really thinking through that process with them um, to not only help them regulate, but then show them and demonstrate and model good strategies for future regulation. All right, the next one we would say is model persistence. Um, I love this one because I think that this is one of those things that um, I certainly forget as an adult. And, you know, when we're interacting with infants and toddlers, I think it's, you know, you, you're an adult, you have lots of years on them. Um, but instead of, you know, trying to be that perfect adult, the teacher in that teacher mode, be a learner and be curious along with children and in the process model persistence. It shows children that it's not important that you succeed every time at everything that you're doing. You're teaching them a growth mindset over time. You're showing them that it's okay to try different strategies. You're teaching them critical thinking skills. Okay, this didn't work. I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't get the 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 jacket into the bag when I tried to put it in this way. Maybe I could do it this way. Again, you're sharing your thinking. You're building on what they might know. And in the meantime, you're modeling that persistence for them. That's incredibly important. There's a lot of research showing that when adults model persistence for children, children in the long run are more likely to, pers uh, to persist in tasks that they find difficult. And I think, you know, if we were to ask each other, you know, what are some of the skills we want to um, really uh, support in children as they develop, I think we want children who are able to persist through things that are rather difficult. And this is one of those great ways to do that. Okay. And then the last one that I would say, again, this is not an exclusive list, but I think a good list of six here is to make uh, lives as predictable as we can for infants and toddlers. We know that children crave schedules. It gives them a sense of security. Um, it helps them have time to explore because they're not worried about, I don't know what's going to happen next. They have a sense of what's going to happen next and what the routine is, what the rhythm is. And so they have that freedom to go and explore their world. So the more we can make it predictable, we know that's also going to help them regulate. It's going to help transitions over time um, and, you know, throughout the day. And it, you know, you can do this in any number of ways. You can post a schedule, use visuals, um, you know, icons for different parts of your day. You can talk about it with children, give them a heads up. You know, usually we, uh, you know, have story time right before we go to bed. But today I was thinking we do something else instead. Give them a heads up if the schedule is going to change and it still becomes that predictable schedule over time. And they know that they can count on you to be that, um, that constant source in their lives. So again, you know, I think that this, this set of six 
gifts that we can give to children to really support their early brain development uh, is a good set of six because it gets at all of those social cues that we know are so very important for those interactions. It gets to some of those behaviors that we can adopt as we interact with infants and children in terms of sharing our thinking, you know, making sure to talk about our emotions in particular, modeling that persistence, the ways that we can really support them through these very critical developmental stages. So again, not exclusive, but I think it's interesting to think about what these nuggets of interactions might look like. And you might be able to think then about, okay, this interaction I had with a child the other day, did it include some of these? And you know, which ones could I really start to include next time? Or which ones do I not do as much and I'd like to work on for myself? Um, I think it's always good to take a step back and do a little self-assessment to think about how we can get better at helping infants and toddlers as they develop. So the next thing that I thought I would do is highlight three projects that we've been working on at at iLabs, the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences at the University of Washington that take some of these features and really think about what it looks like in an intervention kind of setting or in a practice-based setting. So one of the first ones I wanted to, or the first one I wanted to share with you is a study that we've done recently on children's language development and with this idea of asking whether we can coach caregivers to improve the language that they use with infants and toddlers in particular. As we brought parents and children into the lab um, at a variety of ages, at 6, 10, 14, and 18 months of age, and at each of those time points, we had a parent coach, as you see here on the slide, uh, meet with the caregiver in particular. The, the child was oftentimes present, but not exclusively. It was really a meeting between the caregiver and the parent coach. And the coach gave some feedback on some recordings that we had, had taken from language in the home and said, oh, you know, you're you're uh, you know, doing a lot of back and forth talking, you're, you're letting your child, giving your child time to respond, things like that. You're using a lot of parentese or infant directed speech. The caregiver and parent coach would then listen to some audio samples. They talk about some upcoming language milestones, which we actually thought was really important. So particularly with first children, um, you know, parents don't always know what a first word is going to sound like. So we would we would talk about exactly what first words sound like. And then we talk about what the caregiver can do when that happens. So when you're at home, when you hear your child utter that, you know, all important first word, what is your response going to be? So we talk about those upcoming language milestones. And then finally, and I think very importantly, we talked about finding time during everyone's very, very busy day for interactive activities and interactive language rich activities. So things like book share, for example, book sharing times. So we would talk about those everyday moments that you don't necessarily have to add to your day, but times when you can really capitalize on small group or one-on-one -on -one interactions with a child to really have that language rich interaction. So things like diaper changing time, car rides or bus trips, um, dinner time, meal time, meal prep, um, those kinds of, of things. We know everybody's busy and the goal is not to add things to the day, it's rather enhance those everyday moments that, that already exist. So what did we find? So this is the data from our uh, from the kids when they came in at 14 months of age, and I will say that we uh, more recently have published data that looks and follows the kids from from six months all the way out to 20 months of age, and you see very very similar patterns of data. So the blue is um, the blue here is our control group, and the red is our intervention group. And what you can see is that over time. Um, the parents who had the intervention uh, direct more language to their child at a very basic level, so they're speaking more to the child. You can see that the amount of parentese, that infant-directed speech, sing-song, tone of voice, has increased uh, mark markedly. And then you can also see that infants are babbling more um, when they are the when they are the child of a parent who's received that coaching. So we're not only changing adult behaviors here, we're also changing some of those really early indicators of children's language development, which I think is really important. Now, I think one of the most fascinating uh, findings from this study, at least from my perspective, is that we actually had a range of uh, families, uh, family makeup, and families who came from a range of socioeconomic backgrounds. And in fact, we saw no differences over time for, uh, for families um, from different SES backgrounds which tells us that all families benefit from coaching. And I actually think that's really important because 
all parents need help. Um, and so it's really thinking about how we can um, really support caregivers and parents as they are supporting their children's development. Okay, so a second project that I would like to highlight is a research project that we've done recently, again, focused on language development, but here taking together a lot of what we know about children's language development from decades of research um, and really thinking about what it would look like in curriculum form. And so here we're thinking about teaching children a second language. We um, actually conducted the study in Madrid, Spain. Um, so we are teaching children English, uh, mostly because we had a uh, easy access to a lot of English tutors and not so much um, access to a lot of um, tutors who could speak a different language. So we spent we sent uh, some University of Washington undergrads um, over to, Mad to Madrid, Spain, and they they implemented this language development curriculum with children um, living in Madrid who uh, had some exposure to the Madrid's standard English uh, learning curriculum in their infant toddler centers. Um, but ours was much more, we, we thought of it as much more uh, sort of amped up in the sense that it included these five components. So it was, um, you know, very language rich. It included a lot of parentese. It was highly social. It included lots of back and forth interactions and it was very play based. So we created this curriculum over time, taught the tutors the curriculum via this online platform, and they went to Madrid and worked with children for one hour a day for 18 weeks or what amounts to half of the school year. And what we found uh, is, is really quite uh, fantastic language gains for, for children who are in Madrid. Um, and what you see here are children, we, uh, the youngest kids that we saw were seven months of age, and we saw kids all the way up to 33 and a half months of age. And you can see that the red is that intervention uh, group, so the group who had that sparkling language curriculum. The blue bars uh, represent that control group, so the group who is sort of in business as usual English, English uh, learning instruction from the Madrid infant toddler centers. And so you see almost five-fold gains in all areas of language development um, for kids who had the sparkling language learning curriculum. And again, you can see that um, relative to, um, to the control groups in that second graph to the right, please, or to the, to the second graph to the right. Uh, and so what this tells us is this, this curriculum that really brought together a lot of high quality elements that we know help children's language that include all of those sort of best practices and a lot of those gifts that we talked about for infants and toddlers. Um, you know, for everything from being play based to social to, uh, you know, including lots of rich language and all of that kind of support. We know that that really helps children learn. You know, I think this is this is demonstration certainly with regard to language development, but there's no reason to suspect that you know any other area of development would be any different. So from our perspective, this means that all of those elements are really critical as we engage children, particularly infants and toddlers, in whatever kind of curriculum we're working with. And then finally, I just wanted to let you know that we have um, at iLabs, we not only do research, we also have an outreach and education team, and that's a team that I direct. And our goal is really to make this research as accessible and as available to people as possible. And so one of our efforts has been to create a series of online modules that are freely available on our website. Each module is about 20 minutes long or so. It takes a deep dive into a particular area of science, um, talks about why it's important, what we know, and what you can do about it. Um, we use lots of analogies as we um, you know, talk about the science to make it as easy to understand as possible. So you know, one of the favorites that we use when we talk about brain development is, is comparing brain development to a forest of brain connections. So you know, brain starts out as these little saplings in a forest and over time it grows to be much more dense in terms of connections. The modules are also available in a variety of languages. Um, some of them are available in Spanish, Vietnamese, and Somali, which at least in the greater Seattle area are the three most commonly spoken languages other than English. Um, and th they're free, so we hope that you enjoy them um, and use them. They come with discussion guides. You can use them as training, um, uh, training uh, material. They have lots of videos in them. Um, so lots, I think, you know, great use. And so we hope that you will take advantage of that. You can find them on our website, which I'll give you in a second. And just a quick look at some of the feedback that we've gotten on the modules. Um, and so, you know, so we've heard from people, a lot of people look at it like, oh, they just babysit. But the module content empowers the staff to really value what they do and say, hey, I'm a brain builder. 
So with that, um, I will leave you with the module address um, and we're, we're in the process of, of adding some more resources soon. So um, hope that you will be able to, um, to check those out at your leisure. And then um, I think we have some time for questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Lytel. Um, we do have one question from um, Matt that he was wondering. <clears throat> he was, um, I think he's referring to the first slide that has the circles with the lines um, between them. And he was just wondering if this is a, just a choice for the PowerPoint or does all does this all represent some strategies um, some strategies uh, for building blocks to other the other strategies listed? Sure, great question. And I, I honestly, I think it's a little bit of both. I, um, you know, I think that all of those strategies are certainly very interconnected. You know, I think we, uh, you, you heard me talk a little bit, of, you know, by the time you're thinking about making it predictable, you know, routines and schedules, um, you know, help, help regulation, um, you know, they help a lot of those other pieces. So, um, you know, I, I will fully, you know, admit that I have not thought too, too carefully about how all of those lines connect. And I th certainly think we probably could have more connections that are represented there. Um, but I think the point is that, you know, all of this um, is, is incredibly interconnected. And, and frankly, you know, as you think about um, as you think about children's development, uh, you're taking one, you know, I, one of my favorite things to do in workshops is to take a very small, you know, 15 second video of a child and then start to pick out apart everything that's going on. Because I think, you know, even in such a small snapshot, um, you know, you, you really get a good sense of all the com the, the complexity of, of children's development. Um, so I, I really think that, yes, they're certainly all very interconnected. They, you know, some of them build on each other, some more than others. Um, but, you know, certainly as you start to unpack those, those um, you know, the ingredients and some of those experiences that we, the interactions that we have with children, you're gonna find a ton of overlap. All right, thank you so much. And thank you for your wonderful presentation. And I appreciate the connections between the brain development that was shared earlier and then some strategies um, that can be used out in the field. And also just the projects that you're working on to support this is just amazing. And we really appreciate you being on Dr. Lytel. So thank you so much. And we encourage you to continue to ask questions in the chat box. Um, we, can, we will collect those and um, be able to send those off to our guest speakers if we're not able to answer them right away. So thanks for participating in the chat box. All right, so our second fabulous guest speaker we have today is um, Dr. Jennifer Fung. She's a research scientist and professional development specialist at the Herring Center for Inclusive Education at the University of Washington. So I will pass this over to Dr. Fung. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much, April. Um, it's great to be here and it's great. I've been watching the chat box as well. Um, it's great to see all these um, amazing comments and questions and thoughts from you all who are out there in the field doing this really important work. So thank you for having me. And um, today I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what do we do when children aren't developing as expected? Um, how do we take what we know about developmental research and brain research and design early intervention strategies. And um, beyond that, how do we provide effective, high quality professional development on using these strategies? 
So you heard a lot of great information, um, again, from reading the chat box. It seems like a lot of you already um, are really familiar with this information on um, the importance of early relationships and high quality, responsive relationships and environments to the optimal growth and development of a young child's brain. Um, but we also know that for many reasons, whether it's um, an environmental cause, a biological cause, um, a medical cause, um, but we know that for many different reasons, some children don't develop as expected, and um, this might impact their language, it might impact their cognitive skills, um, but oftentimes what we see as a result of these developmental delays is young children not readily acting on their environment, whether that's um, the physical environment, the materials in the environment, or readily interacting and responding to the people in their environment. So it's kind of this... Um, um, transaction if children um, inter I'm sorry interact and initiate and respond less frequently then they are less likely to get that impact um, more I'm sorry that input readily that impacts their development um, so regardless of the cause, we know that it's very important to detect um, these early delays in development and intervene so that children are able to um, interact and initiate and respond to the people and the materials in their environment. So when we think about early intervention, um, I think a really important question is to think about why. Why do we provide early intervention for very young kids? So we know from years of research and experience that early intervention has incredibly positive impacts on young children's um, development and learning outcomes. Additionally, we know that especially because in these very early years when we're talking about early intervention, um, there's a big focus on families and um, building and strengthening relationships, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, but we know that early intervention services also have positive impacts on families. Um, so these impacts are across all developmental domains, um, independence, learning, participation. Um, so we can't overstate the benefits enough of, of high quality early intervention. When we're thinking about early intervention, um, it's also important to talk about who. Um, so I do want to recognize for a moment that when I'm talking about early intervention today, I'm talking about publicly funded early intervention services for children under the age of three. Um, early intervention is a term that's used to describe many different services, um, specially designed instructional services for young children, um, but sometimes those are provided um, through private insurance or families private pay. What I'm talking about today is um, are those services, is that publicly funded system. Um, so when we're talking about that publicly funded early intervention system in the U.S., that falls under an educational law called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. So that's a publicly funded law that mandates free and appropriate public education for all children um, who demonstrate a delay in their development and learning that qualifies them for specially designed instruction. So under that IDEA law, there is a specific component of the law called Part C, and that is focused on early intervention and support for children under the age of three and their families. So while this IDEA law is a federally funded and administered um, law, the Part C component of IDEA, so for children birth to three, is actually a discretionary program. So all states do not have to have a Part C early intervention system. Currently all states do, which is great news. Um, but when we're talking about this being a discretionary program, one of the things that's really important about that is that while there are some mandatory components of that IDEA early intervention system, or Part C early intervention system, um, there is some difference from state to state in what those early intervention services actually look like in practice. Um, so one of the areas where that discretionary um, nature of the of the law comes in is in eligibility. So um, 
the mandatory components of Part C are that children under the age of three who demonstrated developmental delays, so through a standardized norm referenced assessment, um, children who have an established physical or mental condition that um, will result in a high probability of developmental delay, um, children who um, Ex, uh, who experienced um, substance abuse or withdrawal symptoms, and then children where there are substantiated cases of abuse or neglect. So under the federal Part C law, all children who fall into one of these categories can become eligible for Part C services. But when we think about the discretionary nature of the Part C system, um, in some states, children who would be at risk of developmental delay without early intervention services, maybe because of some environmental factor, um, some children, or I'm sorry, in some states, um, children can become eligible for Part C under um, that, that component, but that's not consistent from state to state. So when we're thinking about early intervention in Part C, um, I think it's really important to think about how we provide those early intervention systems to children and families where there, um, a developmental delay is um, suspected, where a child might be at risk, or where that developmental delay or disability has actually been um, diagnosed. So these um, key principles of Part C that you see here on the slide, these are actually mandatory. The, this isn't discretionary. Um, so one critical component of our Part C early intervention system is that the focus and of the of the services of the goals we create as early intervention specialists and the service delivery model is that we're really focused on a family centered um, service delivery model. So families are at the core of, of the um, selecting intervention goals, of designing intervention methods, and really when we're thinking thinking about um, what we are providing instruction and support on, it really is focused on building the capacity and um, building on the strengths of, of families so that they're able to um, help their child meet the developmental goals that are a priority for the family. Another really important um, principle of Part C early intervention is that it's focused on, um, again, that capacity building intervention and support, um, and that that intervention is provided in what we call a natural environment, a child's natural environment. Um, so a natural environment is defined as a, an environment, a setting, a context where a child would be participating um, if they did not have a disability. So oftentimes, we think about this as a place where a child's um, siblings participate or their friends and neighbors participate, any context or setting that's meaningful and important to the family. So as a Part C provider, um, you know, we think about providing um, services in natural environments, home, more often than not, services are provided in a child's home, um, but oftentimes community settings, um, places of worship, um, a child's uh, early learning or, or care setting. Um, so that's a critical component, as I mentioned, of Part C, um, early intervention services, and that really sh uh, shapes and influences how we as early intervention providers um, approach all of our work with young children and families. So again, when we're thinking about the how of early intervention, um, those goals um, that we develop, that we co-develop actually um, as providers along with families and um, primary caregivers, um, really when we're thinking about what those goals look like, um, we're basing that in, in what we know about developmental research and developmental science. Um, so we're thinking about, again, as I stated, um, that the we're focused on relationships, that we're focused on strengthening relationships and providing caregivers with the strategies and support um, so that they're able to build on their child's strengths and expand their child's development and teach them new skills. Um, it, it, 
whatever their priority is for those new skills that are being learned. Um, and then we also focus on um, somehow modifying environments or manipulating environments so that we can target active engagement, the child's active engagement in those environments. So again, when we're thinking about what these early intervention goals look like, what strategies we're selecting, we really are falling back on that developmental research and that information that we know about how young children develop develop in the context of those relationships through active engagement and participation in their environments. So when we're thinking about those early intervention strategies, those really specialized strategies that might be to target language, or they might be to target um, physical development, they might be to target um, adaptive skills and self-help skills, but those are specially designed um, targeted strategies that again, we look back on that um, developmental research to really think about um, what are we going to target and how are we going to target um, those skills. So a critical component of um, again, a key principle um, in the Part C system is that service providers are selecting evidence-based strategies that have been shown through research to impact, to positively impact a child's development. So when we think about how these early intervention strategies might differ from good, high quality um, scaffolding and instruction and support that um, care providers and early learning um, providers are using with young children, these early intervention strategies, they, they might differ in their intensity. Um, so we might be providing more support, more frequent opportunities for a child to engage and get feedback on um, a skill or behavior. Um, the instructional strategies are oftentimes more, um, more focused and more targeted um, using a, a really specialized strategy, like I said, to perhaps address language or um, teach a child to um, walk using a walker or communicate using um, some sort of assistive technology. And then the focus of in um, intervention often does differ as well. Um, oftentimes when we're talking about young children um, and kind of those building blocks of learning, um, when we're talking about young children with delayed development, we're talking about kind of breaking skills down into smaller components and helping um, provide instruction and support to master those smaller components of a skill before we build and um, move on to further, further skills in that developmental progression. So the work that we do at the Hearing Center at the University of Washington, where I work, focuses on designing these um, evidence-based in intervention strategies um, and evaluating them in the context of early learning and care settings. And then once those strategies are proven by research to be effective, then we provide professional development um, to a number of different um, professionals and people across different disciplines. So that's what I wanted to talk about for the second part of my talk today. Um, so when we're thinking about effective professional development and high quality professional development, um, just like we look to the research on early learning and development um, to design and utilize strategies to teach young children. We also look to the research on adult learning, and there's a lot of research now on professional development activities and um, their impact on the use of new strategies by adults. So we look to that research when we are designing our professional development um, activities that we use, like I said, with a variety of different partners. So thinking about effective professional development, there are a few features of high quality PD. Um, so one, the professional development activity that you're using, so whether that's a workshop or whether that's um, a, a, uh, providing a, some sort of reading um, to help somebody increase their awareness of a new skill or whether that's um, something like practice-based coaching. What we really wanna think about is that match between um, the professional development activity and the desired outcome. And I'll talk a little bit more about kind of these levels of, of um, PD outcomes that we might expect from a professional development activity. Um, high quality PD we know also emphasizes what we call that high leverage content. So focus on strategies that we know through research and through experience uh, result in maximum optimal outcomes for young children and families. Another 
another really important um, part of a high quality PD is that the strategy that we're focusing on, um, whether that be, you know, the serve and return, whether that be using assistive technology, whatever it is, that the strategy we're focusing on really closely matches the context in which the strategy will be used. Um, this notion of contextual fit, um, how well the, the strategy meets the priorities and the values and the needs of the person who is going to be using that strategy, whether it's a caregiver, whether it's a parent, whether it's an early learning provider, um, how that strategy fits in with um, their values, their needs, and the context that they're going to be using it in, um, that really impacts how readily a strategy will be, be used in that setting. And then, like I said, um, that uh, high quality professional development um, utilizes adult learning theory and adult learning practices. So when we're thinking about, um, like I said, designing a professional development offering where the activity closely matches the desired outcome, I think it's important to spend a little bit of time talking about um, these uh, different levels of PD outcomes. Um, so when we think about um, engaging in professional development um, and what the outcome for the adult learner might be, um, we really think about that kind of in three different levels. Um, and one thing that's important, and, and we'll talk about this, is that um, as you talk about the difference between the outcomes, they really increase in um, the complexity and the effort on the part of the person providing the, tra uh, the training or the PD and the effort on the part of the adult learner who's receiving um, that professional development and support. So sort of the most um, low complexity and low effort outcomes that we, that we might see from a professional development offering are increased knowledge and awareness. So just, you know, learning about a new um, intervention strategy or, or a new um, instructional practice. What is it? What's involved in it? What's the research behind it? When might you use a strategy like this? Um, so again, that increased knowledge and awareness. Um, thinking about moving up in complexity and effort, um, kind of that second tier of um, PD outcome is to actually develop skills to use that new instructional strategy or that new um, um, curricula, whatever it might be. So to actually develop the skills needed to um, start to think about how I might use that in my work. And then at the most um, complex and the highest level of effort in terms of providing and participating in professional development is to actually use those new skills in context. Um, so this is really important um, because we know that just like all children um, don't learn the same way, all adults don't learn the same way, and we know that all PD is not designed equally. So when we're thinking about the work that I said that we do and a lot of my colleagues do when we're thinking about providing high quality effective professional development, it's really critical to um, be intentional about, about that match between the, the activity and the outcomes that are intended um, as a result of this professional development offering. So when we're thinking about um, building knowledge and awareness, sort of that first tier of PD outcome, um, common PD activities like discussion, some sort of facilitated discussion, like I said, assigning or providing a reading, um, engaging maybe in some sort of professional learning activity, um, or I'm sorry, professional learning community, um, attending a lecture. Um, so these are the most sort of um, low effort, low complexity. Um, and again, like I said, these are really common um, professional development activities that we as um, professionals often engage in. Um, but in terms of what we can expect in terms of an outcome for participating in these types of PD activities, um, these are best matched to increasing someone's knowledge and awareness. Thinking about that second tier and what PD activities are a good
match and have been shown to actually uh, help PD recipients develop their skills in a new area. Um, doing role play or um, reading a case study and then just, you know, designing and suggesting your own solutions. Um, practicing a strategy or an instructional practice during the context of a workshop or a training while receiving feedback from the trainer who has um, expertise and experience in that particular practice. Practice um, modeling by again by the trainer or the person who has expertise in that particular um, strategy. So these are what are considered um, more medium complexity and medium effort PD strategies, and they're most likely to develop skills in a particular area. Then when we think about more, um, the most, um, that kind of highest tier of PD outcome using the new skills in context, whether that's, um, you know, a caregiver or a parent using them in a home setting and early learning or care provider using them in a classroom or a family childcare setting. Um, these require, in order for most people to be able to use those new target skills, these require the highest level of um, complexity and effort in terms of PD strategies. So those would be things like um, using a, a coaching strategy, um, such as practice-based coaching, um, working on an ongoing basis with a, a mentor, somebody again who has expertise in that area and can help with problem solving and action planning for the adult learner. Um, so those, again, um, these types of high quality, high intensity, and I think what's really important about um, these different examples of PD strategies is that they're ongoing and they're matched to the unique needs and strengths um, and skills of the adult learner. Um, so again, you know, just like we think about providing individualized support to children, depending on their um, learning characteristics and the goals that that we have for them. Um, it's just as important to provide individualized and ongoing um, support and problem solving to adult learners in order to help them um, achieve this highest level of outcome, which is using that new skill uh, to help impact a child's learning and development. So like I said, um, this information is based not only on a adult learning theory and our experience providing professional development and training um, to people from a variety of different disciplines and backgrounds. Um, but this is also based in research on effective professional development. Um, so what you see here are um, the, the training components. So those are the PD activities. And this will this graph um, will go from the most low effort and low complexity PD activities um, to the most high effort and and um, high complexity. So this is uh, from a meta-analysis um, uh, looking across a variety of different research studies on the outcomes of different PD activities. Um, so we know from this meta-analysis that um, for participants who engaged in um, training that was really focused on theory and discussion, 10% um, of people who participated in that type of training were able to increase their knowledge. 5% of people who engaged in that type of training in PD were able to actually increase their skills and no participants um, who engaged in that type of PD were actually able to use the target skill in their um, in the classroom in their setting. When you increase the complexity and the, and the effort and use demonstration, so kind of that role playing that we talked about a couple slides ago, 30% um, of participants were able to increase their knowledge. 20% of participants actually um, demonstrated an increase in skills, but still no participants were able to actually take that type of PD and translate that into an increase or use of the target skill in the classroom. When we increase again in complexity, so not just being shown, but having, you know, not just having somebody demonstrate, but actually doing that, that role play with feedback. So I'm going to try this and I'm going to have that expert trainer provide feedback on my use of the target strategy. 60% of people were able to increase their knowledge of the target skill or, or intervention strategy. 60% of people were also able to um, develop their own skills, show that they, um, they, they learned a new skill, but only 5% of people were actually able to take those 
skills that they learned in the PD activity and then use them in the classroom. But then when we look at that highest level of um, effort and complexity in terms of PD, coaching, ongoing coaching in the classroom, um, you'll see that almost 100% of the participants who engaged in this type of professional development activity were able to meet all levels of, of those PD outcomes. So increased knowledge, increased skill, and then that transfer of those skills into the classroom. So like I said, um, at the Herring Center, um, professional development and um, ongoing support to um, leaders, to um, center directors, to early educators, to early care providers. We work with people from a variety of different disciplines and backgrounds and really focus on the use of these um, high leverage strategies and high leverage um, intervention skills that we know are going to positively impact the learning and development of um, young kids who are demonstrating delays or have identified disabilities. Um, so I just wanted to give one example of how we take this approach um, to designing professional development and talk a little bit about what that actually looks like in application for one um, particular um, group of, of partners that we work with. Um, so several years ago, um, the Herring Center was asked to um, come on board and work with Washington's um, Quality Rating Improvement System, um, which in Washington is called Early Achievers. Um, so through the Early Achievers program, there is a cadre of coaches who um, are working with coaches and technical assistance providers who are working with early learning and care providers um, as they uh, are preparing to and then once they are rated through the QRIS. So for those coaches, um, there is a variety of different professional development activities and ongoing support um, that's provided um, by the state uh, through that QRIS. So we were asked to um, enhance and provide um, additional training to the QRIS coaches on um, individualization, inclusion, and these high leverage strategies um, that support children's um, learning in, in early learning and care settings. Um, so when we said, yes, absolutely, we would love to do that, um, we sat down our team and really thought, okay, um, what can we do in terms of professional development? But we really started um, by thinking about what are our PD outcomes? What do we want coaches to to come away with um, as a result of participating in professional development with the Herring Center. And so we decided to really focus on um, increased awareness and knowledge of these um, high leverage individualized strategies and some skill development. And when we're thinking about skill development, we weren't just thinking about um, making sure that the coaches knew how to use these strategies, these high leverage evidence-based practices, um, but we were also thinking about their coaching skills so that they would be able to um, build their their skills on how to coach the providers and the educators that they were working with on the use of these strategies. So going from those those two target PD outcomes and then really thinking about um, you know, our curriculum, what are those high leverage strategies that we think are critical for um, coaches to bring to the field. Um, we then um, designed, like I said, our menu of, of PD offerings. So we really do have a variety of professional development um, activities that we offer for these uh, QRIS coaches, um, including um, short term internships, um, ongoing coaching, ongoing consultation and problem solving. Um, um, and then um, we are building and continue to provide um, a resource library where there are many different um, texts and videos and um, resources. Uh, we have a variety of curricula that people are able to check out and um, borrow and use with the providers and, and educators that they're working with. Um, so kind of the, the bread and butter of these um, 
of this, this PD that we're providing to the QRIS coaches are the short-term internships. So what those look like um, are that people are able to visit the Herring Center where we actually have a small um, inclusive early learning center um, in, in the building on the University of Washington campus. Um, and we've really built those um, internships, those two-day um, um, workshops around people being able to observe in those classrooms. Um, so thinking about the, the, the goals and outcomes, the intended outcomes of the internships, and then how we match up our professional development strategies, um, we do some didactic lecture. Um, there's some skill demonstration because, again, we are focusing on these um, really um, high leverage um, target intervention strategies. Um, we use those classrooms, as I mentioned, to do facilitated observation. And then we do guided debrief. Um, throughout this um, internship experience and then also throughout the ongoing coaching that our um, PD specialists provide to the coaches, um, we use the parallel practice in Washington, um, or I'm, yeah, we use a, a parallel um, process approach. Um, in Washington, the coaching framework that's used by the QRIS coaches is practice-based coaching. And so as our PD specialists are working with the coaches, we are using that parallel process of um, focused observation used to set goals for the QRIS coaches and then providing um, resources um, and other types of, of coaching support to help build the coaches' skills, um, but all designed around that practice-based coaching cycle. Um, so yeah, just a, one example of how we use um, that information and research on adult learning and effective professional development to shape the professional development that we provide in order to um, have those um, PD activities be as successful and effective as possible for the professionals who engage in them. So let's see, I see that there are a couple questions. Um, so is there a theory as to why the use in the classroom is so low for everything as except the most intensive level of training? Um, I think that, you know, that goes back to what I said about individualized um, support um, and adult learning theory. Um, you know, when we're thinking about a more traditional kind of low complexity PD offering, such as, a, you know, an eight hour training or even a two day training, um, while we might have really high quality content and supportive materials and a really experienced trainer, when that person is presenting to a room, um, a group of people, even if it's a small group, um, they really aren't able to provide individual individualized information that takes into account where each of those learners is coming from, those adult learners, where each of them is coming from um, in terms of their prior knowledge and experience. Um, but really importantly, I think that the trainer um, in, those, in those more traditional um, PD activities, they don't know much, if anything, about the setting in which those adult learners are working. And in order to use these strategies um, with fidelity and on an ongoing basis, um, we need to know where they're going to be used as well so that we can help the, the teacher or the provider um, shape and, and potentially modify the use of that strategy so that it fits in with the children and the classroom who are in their setting. Also, um, you know, in terms of that low intensity, those are oftentimes a one time, you know, um, you come, you get the information. And again, like I said, um, even if it's really high quality, um, even if that trainer is really experienced, you get it and then you move on. Um, that ongoing support um, isn't a part of those um, those types of trainings. And um, we know that in order to, to learn new things, changing our behavior as adults um, takes time. And especially if it is a more um, complex skill that we're trying to teach somebody, um, you know, to use a, um, a specially designed instructional strategy that um, people will likely need that ongoing support to um, change their behavior enough that it becomes regular practice.
All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Fung. I really appreciate the connection with all of the importance and how brain development happens and the strategies that Dr. Lytell shared um, and connecting it to professional development and how that research that we know about can really be connected to professional development and ongoing coaching and different um, professional development settings. So really appreciate all of the great information and connections that you made. And please um, continue to type in the chat box if questions come up um, as we move on in our um, webinar today. And um, like I mentioned earlier, we'll be sure to get those questions off so that you can get some answers. Um, and I also wanted to share really quick too that the internship that Dr. Fung was sharing about, I actually was able to participate in that when I was a QRIS coach in Washington. And that internship and the way it was implemented changed my professional view on PD and coaching um, tremendously and to the point where I actually wrote my master's thesis on my experience and created a training um, based on how I learned and what I did. And so um, it was just a really great connection to my learning and to my, my master's degree program and to, to the field that I was working in. So it really does work. And I was just really um, in awe of the work that was being done there. So thank you for sharing that. All right, so I'm gonna hand this over to Holly and Holly is gonna share another poll with you. Great, thank you so much, April. And thank you, uh, Dr. Lytell and Dr. Fung. Uh, it was really delightful to hear about the approaches and examples and uh, to PD and just the plethora of resources that you shared. And now I want to hear from you because in addition to the Herring Center and uh, iLabs, we want to know, we have, you'll see your screen change and we have a poll for you. We want to know what are the, which of the following resources have you found helpful that have supported you in your work, whether you're that caregiver with baby in arms, toddler in arms, uh, the professional, uh, providing relationship-based professional development, which are the resources that uh, are listed here? You can check all that apply that have been helpful in applying your research and theory to practice. So we're just gonna take a second and we know, guess what? We just have space for these few. So go ahead and type into the chat box, what are we missing here? We've got um, the iLabs modules, maybe you've used those, maybe you've used some resources from zero to three. Oh, Brenda, thank you. You're saying that uh, the PITC resources have been awesome. Uh, example of resources um, and we've got a lot of folks saying that um, e the early uh, childhood learning and knowledge center from um, early head start and head start lots of program for infant toddler caregiver coming up in the chat yes uh, they know uh, relationship-based practice um, and the national association for the education of young children we've got some people mentioning in the chat here and maybe none of these are familiar. And we feel really glad that um, those of you feel brave enough to, even if the, the poll is anonymous, to go out on a limb and say that uh, that uh, you are these are you're just hearing about these for the first time. So again, I'm going to go back and and look at the chat. Lots of early learning and knowledge center. Um, so we can we can post a link in there to those resources. So let's take a look at um, our polling results, and and we really appreciate all of your participation here. Oh, Asada, I love that one. The National Center for Traumatic Stress Network. Awesome research to practice modules on supporting young children, and uh, thank you for mentioning that one. And looks like. Uh, April and, and uh, everyone, zero to three is really resonating with folks. Harvard Center for the Developing Child, and many of you are familiar with pyramid model approach, and that was uh, materials developed on best practices in early childhood uh, out of the Center for Social Emotional Foundations for early learning. Uh, so we'll give you one more second. See, uh, National Center on Pyramid Model Innovations, Jessica, thank you. Uh, that's extended that pyramid model uh, research and, and materials in a lot of way. Conscious discipline. I think someone mentioned that that resource earlier that this um, when Dr. Lytell was sharing earlier that this reminded them of of that. Um, coaching model from Roth and Sheldon. Carol, thank you for sharing that. As I was listening to Dr. Fung um, and Dr. Lytell was thinking about that model as well. You all are a wealth of information and resources and knowledge. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to, 
to share your go-to resources for translating research to practice in your in your work and for also um, responding to our poll here. So uh, we shared the results and continue to share resources in the chat. And at this time, I'm going to hand it over to April and she is going to highlight some state and territory examples of states that have done a, a real tried really hard to translate research to practice in their professional development and quality improvement efforts. So April, let's hear a little bit more about those. Thank you, Holly, and thank you all for sharing your resources and engaging in the polls. And um, like I mentioned in the chat box, I think that our profession does a really good job of finding applicable and reliable resources to better our practices in the field. So thank you and please continue to share. All right, so as Holly mentioned, we are going to share some state examples. Um, we have two states we're going to highlight to share with you on what they are doing. So our first state we have here, we have Massachusetts, and they have a campaign called Brain Building in Progress. And so what their kind of ultimate goal here is that um, it promotes the role that everyone can play um, in building young children's brains. And so this and this campaign is intended for anybody and everybody who wants to participate uh, businesses families educators community centers um, early childhood programs legislatures um, and so um, they the, the bullet there that says brain building zones those can be found in places such as museums libraries recreation facilities um, and other ECE and educational programs. And some of the resources that they've created to support this initiative is um, just different activities, um, marketing materials, logos, and fact sheets that these, um, that the audience can pull from and use within their organization to help support the understanding of building young children's brains. And the other really great thing about this initiative is that the resources that are provided can be found in many, many different languages. The next state we'd like to highlight is Georgia, and they have um, what's called Better Brains for Babies. And so their ultimate goal here is to maximize Georgia brain power. And that sounds pretty powerful to me. They want to do this for everybody. Um, and this initiative is supported by the Georgia Division of Family and Children's Services, the Office of Prevention and Family Support. And so you can kind of see here a timeline and activities that this initiative was able to follow. Um, and what happened is that 14 public and private Georgia organizations were interested in improving child outcomes. And so they formed a collaborative team to support this initiative. And so the, t the Training for Trainers, the TFT model that they talk about here was actually modeled after Florida's Starting Points Initiative. And these 500 adult educators and trainers that were trained had to commit to going out in their community and training at least four other organizations. And so you can imagine 500 individuals going out to train for organizations. That's a lot of folks that this initiative touches um, in supporting um, George, maximizing Georgia brain power. So it's just amazing. Um, and they, this has actually undergone three revisions since 1999. Um, and they update it based on res the most current research that comes out. And so the most recent revision happened um, in 2011 and 2012. And what happened there is they did a complete revision an update to reflect, reflect the most recent advances in scientific understanding of brain development. So there's a lot of great things happening in um, a lot of states and we're only able to highlight two here. So, all right. So the last part here is we just wanted to share some strategies in supporting the role that we have in um, building brain development and um, using that research that we know about and putting it into practice. Um, and so here's just some examples that we'd like to share for you. And this is really where putting that research to practice happens. 
So we also know that um, babies' brains are wired to be in responsive relationships from birth, and that meaningful interactions really are what literally build the brain. <clears throat> So when an infant trusts and feels tr has trust and feels secure, the brain grows stronger. And also knowing that when adults are responsive in their interactions that and meet infants and toddlers' needs, that there's a strong foundation that's created in the child's um, brain that supports later learning and relationship development. And we saw that as an example um, with our brain slide when we were talking about the different parts of the brain and what happens there. And finally, we just know that brain development is so important and both of our guest speakers really talked about, you know, the first three years of life, that's when the most growth happens and we can't go back and fix, you know, what, what did or didn't happen. And what we can do and what we do know is that responsive relationships um, really are what make the brain healthy and the children to grow into, um, you know, older children and adults that have those executive functioning skills if they have the, these relationships um, from birth. All right, so I'm going to pass this back over to Holly, and she's going to share a, a few of our resources with you that we'd like you all to know about. And you also have some more polls coming up. Holly? Thank you so much, April. We appreciate that. Um, that summary of the, the great takeaway messages. And we just want to bring your attention to a couple of resources that will help you, we believe, in taking and extending your research to practice uh, that may add to the, the resources that you're already using. And you may see that a lot of this is, is, is new, is not new information, it's just packaged in a different way. So the Infant Toddler Resource Guide is, is a, uh, I guess you could call it a clearinghouse, if you will. And there are resources for just about every role that we identified when you completed that poll earlier. Whether you are a state level policy um, professional, baby and toddler hero, there are there's information and resources for you to make sure that your policies and practices are doing the best by our babies and toddlers. Uh, there's also uh, supports and resources and materials for uh, professional development and technical assistance providers. We saw a lot of you indicate that that's your role. You're doing coaching, mentoring, and consulting. And there are resources for you to, to use in your training, to think and reflect on and coaching. Uh, so be sure to check out that section. And then if you're an infant toddler caregiver, which we or which we saw in the beginning, there are many of you here. We're so glad. There's lots of wonderful video clips on infants and toddlers for you to uh, to reflect on your own practice and see quality infant toddler care and practice. And hopefully you feel really validated and see a lot of your own practices reflected in these videos. And then there's just some really great uh, synopsis of what is relationship-based care? What does that mean? And what does it look like and sound like and feel like? And why is language development important um, for babies when they, they're, they're not speaking yet? And how does it connect to the other aspects of of development, whether it be social, emotional, or develop, or um, physical or cognitive development. So we hope that you take some time to, to check out the Infant Toddler Resource Guide. Uh, we can post that web link in the, the chat again for you. Uh, but this Infant Toddler Resource Guide was developed for you, our infant and toddler, our heroes, the, and the great work that you're doing um, with infants and toddlers and caregivers and their families directly or on behalf of the infant toddler caregiver workforce and those who support them. So uh, thanks for taking the time. We've also posted just a couple of resources here for you. Um, there's a zero to three a resource at the top here, Growing the Brain uh, for birth to five years. We've got some resources from the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard, at, at Harvard University. Uh, and there's a few resources and links there. And I see that my colleague Rana and teammate has posted the Infant Toddler Resource Guide link in the chat there. So we hope that it's meaningful uh, to you and that you're, it, it's valid, both validating in, in your efforts and your professional development. And we can't thank you enough for doing this important work. And so we have a couple more questions for you. We wanna hear from you just a little bit more before we go. And we want to know uh, what this experience was like with you. And I'm, 
I'm just kind of picturing back to Dr. Fung's slides there and, and, and Dr. Lytle's connections of the scaffolding of learning. And we want to know uh, what, uh, uh, you're gonna see your screen change in just a second, knowing that this was a webinar uh, and that you brought, as you showed us in the chat, a whole lot of knowledge here um, about best practices on uh, brain development and applying research and theory to practice. Tell us, how has your knowledge improved regarding, if you can reflect on it in the moment, how has your knowledge improved uh, regarding how to support um, infant and toddler brain development and uh, implementing the strategies to best support infants and toddlers? And again, your feedback is anonymous. Um, so if you feel uh, it's not improved, let us know. Maybe it's a little bit improved. Maybe it's moderately improved and uh, maybe it's you feel like it's significantly improved. So we're just going to leave that poll up for you for a second and then we'll um, move to the next question that we have. And I see that uh, folks are saying um, moderately improved. You've you've come away with a little bit more knowledge, which, you know, I think about Dr. Fung's slide and um, we would count that a success, right? Uh, if, if it's even slightly improved um, with this web-based seminar format that we're in. Um, we tried to make it as high tech and as high touch as possible. And we're so grateful to Sarah and Jen and in April for facilitating our learning and also to you as our, our co-facilitators in learning this shared learning experience that you've you've helped your participants your your uh, classmates participate in with you sharing your learning with us in the chat okay well thank you for taking the time to respond to that question for us and we've just got one more question for you and we'll we'll see the the slide change um, how likely are you to use the strategies shared to support the application of research to practice in your work? How likely are you to use any of these strategies? You had you learned about some some awesome approaches from the iLabs work and projects that that Sarah taught us about. Uh, maybe this was a refresher for you. Maybe you had heard that about those before. But what are you thinking? How likely are you to use any of these strategies, uh, both shared by your your uh, your classmates in, in the seminar today and uh, Sarah and Jen and, and the strategies that April shared as well in the state example. So some of you said, you, you a lot of you said actually, whoa, a lot of you said you're definitely going to use some of these strategies shared today in the application of research or practice in your work. Some of you said it's not applicable to your work and that's okay. And what about um, you will consider? A couple of you said you will. So some, many of you, as we saw, are already doing this. We're really, really glad to hear that. So thank you so much for participating in that, giving us feedback on your learning experience today. Okay. I think I'm going to turn it back over to uh, to April and uh, with to close us out for our learning today, April. Thank you, Holly, for facilitating the polls. And I just want to say a final thank you to all of you for participating in our webinar today. And I hope it was worth your time and worth your while. And I want to send a, a sincere and special thank you to our two amazing presenters. Um, Dr. Fung and Dr. Lytel, we really, really appreciate your time and your knowledge and just being able to be with us today and the prepping and planning and implementation. Um, you have um, done a lot for our field and we really appreciate you sharing all of the resources and experiences and a, a sincere thanks to all of you um, out in webinar land um, from us at the Infant Toddler Network in the State Capacity Building Center. Thank you and we hope you'll continue to um look at our resources and reach out if you ever need anything um, so with that i um, will sign off and i hope you all have a lovely rest of your day and have a great long weekend this weekend so it was great to see you bye thanks